Here we go. So I'm going to assume that you can see that and just give me a shout if you can. not um, So my name is Catherine Crompton. I'm a psychologist and I'm a researcher um, at the Salveson Mind Research Centre at the University of Edinburgh. And um, thank you so much uh, for having me along today to talk about peer support for autistic and um, otherwise neurodivergent young people. Um, I really hope it's a useful session. I'm planning on speaking for about kind of 20, 25 minutes. Um, and then for the rest of the time, uh, we'll have a Q&A where I'll be joined by Fergus Murray. Um, so I am a researcher and psychologist and my research focuses um, on how autistic people communicate. Um, I'm particularly interested in um, the differences in how autistic people communicate when they're with other autistic people and when they're with non-autistic people. Um, and I'm uh, really interested in how this works in terms of kind of real world interactions. Um, so how, uh, how learning more about how autistic people um, communicate um, can be useful for things like peer support um, and also on understanding um, kind of the positive impacts that autistic um, identity and community can have for people. Uh, so I just want to kind of say at the start that there's some things that are in my talk today that are a little bit um, tricky or difficult. I'm going to be talking about some of the kind of common difficulties that autistic pupils um, might face when they're at school. Um, I appreciate this can be quite a difficult topic for some people. Um, so please take some time if you need to, if you want to pop out, that's absolutely fine by me. Um, but I just kind of wanted to flag that there might be some kind of trickier bits. So being a teenager is a really kind of formative time um, in development. It's a very kind of formative time for everyone. Um, it's a time where you're finding out more about yourself as a person and forming your identity. It's a time when you generally have a bit more independence from your family and your parents or carers, um, and you have some space to learn about the things that you like, the things that you don't like, um, what your strengths are, what things might be more difficult for you. You're just learning a little bit more about yourself. Um, it's also a time when you're kind of forging new friendships uh, and new relationships, and you're often kind of navigating quite complex, unspoken, um, social rules for the first time. You're also thinking about your future uh, and what you might want to do with your life and what steps you need to take now to make sure that you know what you want to do might be a possibility for you. So there's a lot going on. There's, it's a phase of life where there's a lot of kind of self-discovery and kind of development of identity um, for everyone. And being an autistic teenager has got its own layer of stuff on top of uh, of the things um, that I've already mentioned. So they're kind of interwoven with all these other teenage experiences. So in terms of your identity, you might know that you're autistic, but you might not really know kind of what that means or how that fits into your identity. You might not know any other autistic people at all. who has um, quite high support needs or, or a learning disability too and so you know you might feel like you don't really understand how the two of you have the same diagnosis you don't really understand what the similarities are between the two of you when your experiences are so different um, we know that autistic people can have quite a negative understanding of their autism and view it as quite a negative um, thing so when kind of teenagers have gone through this diagnostic process that's predicated on them having deficits in social communication and deficits in social interaction and deficits in something wrong with them it's not really surprising that that they have a very negative view of being autistic and teenagers in particular who maybe just kind of want to fit in with their peer group and don't want to have something that makes them you know different from the other people around them that can be really, really difficult. And to have had doctors and psychologists tell you that you have these deficits in these areas, it makes sense that people um, can view this part of them, themselves and their identity as quite a negative thing. You might have other identities that are important to you. So you might be LGBTQ or you might have uh, your, your ethnicity or your religion might be really important to you. And you might not know how they fit with being autistic. You might, just feel like there's no one quite like you. 
And if you kind of feel like that and you don't see anyone perhaps in the media or in books or TV or anyone that you really identify with, that can be a really isolating experience. We know that autistic people, autistic young people can really struggle to talk about what it's like being autistic for them because it's just not really a conversation that's being had that much. Um, again, uh, you might feel uh, like you want to have friends or have relationships, but feel like you have to hide who you are or struggle to understand why people behave the way that they do. And when we're thinking about things like future, that again can be really difficult because we so often hear um, about kind of low employment rates for autistic adults or autistic adults uh, excelling in kind of very specific fields that not everyone wants to work in. Um, and so without any kind of role models or anyone that you really identify with, um, the future can feel really scary and it can be a really isolating time. We also know that kind of socially, um, the mainstream school environment can be quite difficult for autistic pupils. So we know that um, autistic pupils have told us things like they don't really feel included, um, they have lower levels of peer socialization, fewer friends, they, um, they can often feel disconnected from their school community and they're less likely to participate in class. So socially as well, there's kind of a lot going on there. And Though we know that there are differences in the way that autistic people can socialize and communicate, autistic people understand the concept of friendship and want to have friends and navigating um, the kind of secondary school phase of life as an autistic person and struggling with kind of making friendships can be really, really difficult. It's really, really important for autistic young people to have the opportunity to build good social relationships with their peers. Um, so research has shown us things like um, having just one or two close friends can have a positive impact um, on adjustment. Um, it can buffer um, stressful life, uh, life events, um, improve self-esteem and decrease symptoms of both anxiety and depression. So it might be something that's a bit trickier, um, but it's still something that is very desirable for autistic young people. Um, and, you know, something that can have, you know, really quite wide reaching benefits. So it's something that's really, really important to consider. So quite often the way that people um, can try to support autistic young people friends is more um, is to kind of have an intervention where um, autistic young people are buddied up with a non-autistic peer um, to help kind of bridge that gap and to help them engage um, with a social group of their peers. So, you know, you might um, pair an autistic um, student up with a non-autistic student and kind of hope that that helps them kind of merge in with that group a little bit. The other thing that can sometimes happen is that um, autistic people might be enrolled in a kind of social skills training um, where they're kind of taught specific social behaviors or normative strategies to help them in their relationships with their non-autistic neurotypical peer group. And while it can be useful to have the skills and the vocabulary to be able to understand the way that the non-autistic world works and to be able to understand why people might behave the way they do. Um, encouraging autistic people to um, kind of hide their natural, um, comfortable ways of interacting can have very long-term negative effects. So you know, training autistic people to behave in a way that, that is very unnatural to them it isn't, it isn't the way to facilitate positive long-term um, relationships with other people. Um, and, and as Monique spoke to you about last week, um, kind of hiding who you are and masking can have kind of very long-term negative effects. So masking can be a really, really exhausting thing. Um, it can use up a lot of mental resources. It takes a really prolonged effort by autistic people to mask these natural behaviors is it causes a lot of anxiety and stress and increases the risk of uh, mental illness and suicide. And so what we need to be doing is thinking if there is a way to support autistic young people to make friends on their own terms um, in a way that is comfortable and, and minimizes the need for them to behave in a way that isn't natural or comfortable for them. 
And so peer support might be a really great way of doing this. Peer support has been used extensively with other types of minority groups in schools. Um, so one example is um, LGBTQ groups um, within schools and, and peer support has been used with LGBT uh, groups for quite a while now with, it, with, uh, with good success. However, so far there hasn't been any research uh, on peer support for autistic young people. Um, however, over the next few years, we are going to be uh, doing some work on this. There has been some preliminary work done with autistic adults. Um, and we, uh, we found that they can... Uh, we also know some, some other kind of beneficial aspects of being part of the autistic community for autistic adults. So in terms of kind of feeling proud of being autistic, having a strong autistic identity, spending time with the autistic community. This is all linked to kind of positive mental health and well-being for autistic adults. We haven't yet looked at this in children, but we're, we're uh, hoping to do this uh, over the next couple of years. But the idea is that peer support programs could provide a space for autistic pupils to interact with each other without having to mask their natural behaviours. Um, so it's really important for autistic pupils to have um, space to develop kind of self-understanding and relationships with others um, and peer support might be a really great way to do this. So while we're yet to start the research on how effective peer support is for young people, we have done some initial work um, with uh, autistic people who are recent school leavers, so autistic people who have left school in the last five years or so. And the research that we did with this group is we did um, a series of in-depth interviews with them uh, where we asked them about their experiences of peer support, their thoughts about peer support, um, whether this is something that they would have liked when they were at school, and if so, what that might have looked like for them, um, what the kind of barriers and challenges might be. And this has been a really useful um, first step for us to understand how peer support might work within a mainstream setting. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the things that were highlighted as being important considerations uh, when thinking about peer support for autistic young people. So the, the general headline is that um, autistic people felt very positive about peer support within schools, which is, which is good. Um, so you know, one person has said, I think in the later years of high school, when I started struggling with things, it would have been great to have had that sort of peer support around. And that was the general sentiment was that peer support is definitely a desirable method of support within a mainstream school. So our research participants have told us things like peer support should embrace neurodiversity and make a space for like minded peers. So participants told us that what they would like at, when they were at school was to have a space where they could spend time with other neurodivergent peers. So interestingly, this wasn't just other autistic people. They were interested in time with other autistic people, but they also wanted to broaden it out and include perhaps people with ADHD or Tourette's or other kinds of neurodivergence. Um, so lots of people said things, lots of participants said things like it would be useful because it would bring lots of different experiences together and perhaps would give uh, the opportunity to share lots of different strategies for things that had worked um, or things that people had found helpful. Um, other people highlighted that, it, you know, quite often people will uh, be kind of multiply neurodivergent. So you might have someone who is autistic and have ADHD. And so having a space where you have people with all different kinds of neurodivergence, you know, you're more likely to find someone that clicks with you or, or for them to make a suggestion of something that's helpful for you. Um, and so it was generally felt that having a very inclusive environment that was kind of broadly inclusive of all types of different neurodivergence would be best. It was also suggested that peer support might also include people who are neurotypical, but who are struggling with their mental health. Um, so uh, again, going a little bit broader than kind of your kind of typical conception of, of neurodivergence. But again, there's obviously a lot of overlap here between experiencing um, difficulties with mental health and being neurodivergent. So uh, having a space where people could talk about these things, people felt would be very beneficial. Um, and a kind of additional side benefit to having peer support that is more broad than simply autism peer support is that it affords a level of cover and anonymity um, to people. So 
people don't have to out themselves as being autistic by going to an autism group. So quite often autistic uh, teenagers have uh, told us that they, you know, their peers didn't know that they were autistic. Um, they didn't know how to start that conversation with them. They didn't know how to tell their friends that they were autistic. And so they just didn't know. And so having a group that is more kind of neurodivergent um, offers that kind of level of cover and anonymity for people who aren't comfortable with sharing the information that they're perhaps autistic with their peer group quite yet. Another important part of peer support that was highlighted um, was to build confidence and pride in being neurodivergent. So we heard a lot about um, internalized stigma from these participants. So as I said, it can be a very, very difficult thing to go through to be an autistic teenager and to you know, be told that you have deficits in X, Y, and Z. And it's not surprising that people carry a lot of internalized stigma. And um, so we, we heard things like, you know, I, I remember wasting quite a lot of energy at hating the facets of my personality that were most autistic. Um, the stigma is something that follows me now, even though I'm still really positive about being autistic. Um, and so, as I mentioned earlier, it is really hard for autistic people to talk about what it's like being them, but having some space with other people who are going through the same kind of process as you can be really, really useful. Um, and again, I know Monique spoke to you a lot last week about the benefits of fostering a kind of positive identity. And this is something that kind of peer support space could really help. A couple of other things that were highlighted as being uh, important uh, was that the neurodivergent pupils uh, within the peer support uh, played a really key role in terms of the leadership and direction of the group. Um, so rather than the kind of, you know, rules and regulations and direction of the group being defined by staff, um, the participants felt like, you know, that should be really something that is led by them. So participant, uh, one participant said, it's much more useful when the people involved are able to contribute to how the group is run and how it's done. It's quite beneficial in order to get our perspectives on things and be able to take care of our needs. It was also suggested that the peer supporters contributions to the group are recognized by the school as being important and being an activity that involves responsibility and skill. So that being a part of the group being recognized as something that is kind of a positive attribute and something that should be kind of applauded and encouraged. Um, another thing that was flagged was the importance of peer space being inclusive and acceptable uh, and accessible um, so peer support space requires kind of thought and consideration it's not simply a case of finding a room and saying here's the room for peer support there are considerations that need to be put in place particularly around what's beneficial for autistic people specifically so using clear language to aid understanding help, helping people know what to expect when they go there um, having a consistent and reliable schedule um, support for building and managing um, friendships and you know being there to support any kind of difficulties there all these things are really important similarly we know uh, that kind of peer support groups should be aware of and welcoming to people of all backgrounds and identities. So, for example, we know that autistic people are more likely to be outside the gender binary, they're more likely to be non heterosexual, and peer support um, space needs to be inclusive of, of everyone and not have kind of excessive gatekeeping. Um, another kind of really important thing is training for peer mentors, helping them to understand what a peer mentor is and isn't, the kind of boundaries of that role. Um, and kind of helping them to understand um, how to get help if they're worried about someone and what the other methods are of them getting support within the school. And a really important thing is flexibility in terms of the format of the group. Um, so whether it's kind of more a kind of space for talking and chatting about things that are difficult, whether it's more activity based, whether it's a kind of combination of the two. Um, Similarly, talking to the group about kind of how frequently they want to meet, whether one-to-one -one or small group is, is preferred, um, and what kind of things they want to focus on when they're having discussions. So all of these things kind of need to be taken into consideration at the kind of individual and the school level. There's no right or wrong way 
of doing it, it depends on what the pupils prefer, but it's a conversation that needs to be um, kind of had and followed up on um, over time. So in terms of what's happening now, as I said, we haven't managed to do the research looking at the kind of efficacy of peer, of peer support in schools because of the, the pandemic, um, but starting next year, we are going to be um, kind of co-creating um, some materials to help facilitate neurodivergent peer support in schools. So we're going to be working with autistic um, and neurodivergent young people, um, as well as schools and teachers to create a kind of toolkit to support um, peer support in schools. Um, and we're going to be looking for schools to trial that peer support model and looking at the impact that it has um, on kind of mental health, well-being, um, friendships uh, and educational engagement. So we're really excited about this bit of work. We're really excited to get started on it. Um, and, and yeah, we, we hope that it will be uh, a really great piece of work. So in the meantime, uh, I kind of want to finish by quickly noting some of the other ideas that um, some of our participants had about fostering a positive autistic identity that are perhaps a little bit less kind of labor intensive than starting up a full peer support group. They're a little bit kind of quicker and easier to get off the ground. So this, uh, these might include things like uh, finding a way to help autistic young people engage with a kind of broader um, autistic community. So this might be kind of directly. So perhaps if there's an autistic member of staff who's happy to do a bit of mentoring, that can be a really uh, nice way of kind of helping autistic people imagine what the future might be like for them and identify strategies that might be helpful for them. That can be a really nice way of doing that. Um, all through sessions like we're doing here, where you know we've had some really great autistic speakers come in and talk about their own experiences. Um, finding something like that, where you're kind of making these direct connections with other autistic people can be something that's really powerful. Something less direct might be um, finding things like books or podcasts created by autistic people and sharing them uh, with autistic young people. There's a lot of neurodivergent people out there um, with a range of different backgrounds and interests. And if you can find something that specifically resonates with that pupil, if you can find something that they have specifically in common with this other person kind of above and beyond the fact that they're autistic, then that can be a really, a really great thing. Um, so I'm actually working with a student at the moment um, who's creating a, a library of resources um, and a library of kind of books and podcasts and different types of media that, that can be shared with autistic young people. So uh, um, we're hoping that's going to be finished in the next month or so and that we'll be able to, to share that with you. Um, but in general, just widening people's views, making them feel less alone and more positive about their identity is a really, really powerful thing. So I'm going to finish up there, I'm going to stop talking. Um, so thank you very much for listening and I am very happy to take your questions. I can't see if Fergus is here yet, so I'm going to stop screen sharing. Yes, we have got okay. Hi, Fergus is here. Hi, so I'm going to take um, off. It's Fergus. Do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, sure. Hi. So I am Fergus Murray. I'm a, a science teacher based in Edinburgh, and I am currently the chair of the Autistic Mutual Aid Society, Edinburgh. Brilliant. Um, I think I have pinned the two of you so everyone can see you. I hope that's working. Um, so I will let's go straight into the Q&A then. Um, so just a reminder, people, please pop your questions in the Q&A box if you can, rather than the chat. That just makes it a little bit easier for me to keep track of them. Um, so we have a question here um, who is asking, how do we know that autistic people are more likely to be non-heterosexual or non-binary? I'm autistic and it's the first I've heard of that. Where does this information come from? So um, Catherine or Fergus, do you want to give that one a go? I've been talking for a long time, Fergus. Do you want to give it a go? <laughs> I mean, there have been multiple studies, and anyone who has been in a room with dozens of other autistic people where the question of sexuality and/or gender identity has come up will have noticed that there are clearly 
way more of us, uh, sorry, us, um, way more bisexuals and non, not entirely cis people um, in the autistic population than there is in the population at large. Um, whether that's re because there are really more bisexual or trans or non-binary people or just because autistic people are more likely to realize is anybody's guess at this point. Based on self-identification, it is clear that there are much higher rates in the autistic population. Okay, so um, that's, yeah, I think that's, a, it's just such a fascinating question, isn't it, Rebecca? Anyway, um, so someone is wondering, how would you advertise, sorry, my cat is joining us, this is why I'm doing something odd in the corner. Um, Someone is wondering, how would you advertise to join a group in school without drawing attention to and outing the pupils who join? So I wondered if you had any thoughts on that, Catherine or Fergus. Do you want me to go first? Mm. No. This is something that came up a lot and something that we, we talked about in the, in the interviews that I did with, with the Autistic Recent School Leavers. Um, and it is definitely something that really does need to be considered. People had lots and lots of different views about the right way to do it, which I think means that there isn't a right way to do it. Um, so, um, you know, some people were just like, oh, you should just say in the registration class every morning, uh, the, you know, registration class at the start of the year, we're, we're running this neurodivergent group this year. And if you would like to join, this is how you do it. Um, and then leave it up to people. Um, some people um, wanted a bit more kind of stealth involved and just to be kind of pulled aside by a teacher. I think it is something that would need to be kind of discussed at the school and the pupil level, because as I say, it doesn't seem like there is a right way to do it and people will have kind of very different um, thoughts about the right way to do it. Um, I mean, some people were super open. They were like, just put up posters, people will come. And it might be a bit of a kind of hybrid that works like that. So it might be a case of being quite open and saying, this is a thing that we're running. And if you would like to come, you can come. And then perhaps for pupils who are maybe a, a, a bit less kind of outgoing or a bit less confident to, to, to go to something like this, if you're aware that they're um, neurodivergent, to kind of speak to them about it on a one-to-one -one, um, basis. Um, but I think it depends on your kind of relationship with a pupil and what you think is best for them. There definitely didn't seem to be a consensus on the right way to do it. What do you think, Fergus? It, it partly depends on the nature of the peer support, right? You, you talked about how it could be something that includes non-neurodivergent people, potentially, along with the, the neurodivergent kids. Um, you know, I, I've thought about starting some kind of neurodiversity club at my school where you know you wouldn't need to be neurodivergent to take part but um, most of the kids who took it up almost certainly would be as you say I don't think that's the right answer but it's worth experimenting with um can I ask Fergus just building on that a little bit before I go back to the questions in the Q&A what do you think as well is the role of neurodivergent staff in that kind of, you know, setting up that kind of group or, or, or creating an environment where, um, where it, it doesn't feel like a, an awkward or a shameful thing to be going to a group like that? Yeah, good question. Um, I think knowing that there are neurodivergent teachers and or other staff um, can do a lot to reduce the stigma associated with neurodivergence. Um, I mean, I think of, you know, all of the sort of LGB alliance and whatever, sorry, that's, that's the hate group, isn't it? All of, you know, there've been various kind of, uh, lesbian, gay, bi, trans related clubs at schools. And I think it's probably always a bit awkward if they're set up by a straight cis member of staff. Um, but maybe that's still better than them not existing, right? Yeah, great. Um, so uh, Jill here is asking you, Catherine, to elaborate a bit more on the peer support materials. She thinks it sounds like something they'd like to do in her school, which is People's High. Thank you very much, Jill. That's great. 
And maybe relatedly, Laura is asking about the importance of training for peer mentors in a peer support group. What would this look like and where would we get it? So I wonder if you could just tell us a bit more about, you know, what might be the sort of resources that you would hope to produce to support that kind of work? Yeah, sure. So I think that we don't, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. OK, so as I said, there, there are um, other um, peer support frameworks out there. And while there will need to be kind of specific considerations to a neurodiversity peer support model, there's definitely things that we can build on and that have already been done and that are already working well, importantly. So um, I don't I don't want to keep uh, stealing all the LGBT materials, but we do know that that's a framework that's worked really well in the in the US and the UK and that they have materials on how to start a peer support group, um, how to um, you know, get pe pupils engaged and involved. Um, and the training that they give to um, peer mentors, which is really, really important because the last thing that you want from a peer support group is for um, the people there to feel um, like the weight of the world is on them. It's, you know, they're there as a, as a peer mentor and to, and to kind of engage in that support. But, you know, it, the, there are inevitably going to be difficult things and it's not their responsibility as a, you know, as a teenager to be dealing with that. And so it's really important to to know the boundaries of that role. So I think it will be a kind of combination of us um, having a review of some of the materials that already exist. Um, and um, then we're gonna work with uh, a group of neurodivergent adults um, who are involved in education in some way or another, and a group of neurodivergent young people to make sure that the materials are A, covering the kind of topics that they're involved in. So they might involve things like identifying um neurodivergent role models or neurodivergent people and kind of discussing you know how uh you know what that's like and and, and um the kind of the similarities and differences that they might experience to them or it might involve something more like identifying strategies for self-care or identifying um you know new fun hobbies or some Thing like that so it'll be a bit about content and a bit about making sure that the materials are accessible to them um and kind of work in, in a kind of language that's understandable for everyone so um yeah we don't have the materials yet it's going to be a bit of work that's starting next year um, but that's our kind of plan for how we're gonna how we're gonna build them and how we're gonna create them and we'll share all of the materials after they're created as well so they'll be kind of free to download on our website Thank you so much. Um, this is a very important question, um, maybe to Fergus initially. Um, as an autistic person, I have found the whole such and such a famous person is autistic to be quite damaging. Um, when you already struggle enough to feel like you fit into society and get normal everyday things done like other people, the last thing you want to hear about is some autistic high achievers. It just reinforces your own lack of self-worth. I think it's such an important point, Fergus. I don't know what your thoughts are on that. It's a difficult one, isn't it? There's there's a lot of subtlety there. Because on some level, you know, you do want to hear about people who are a bit like you who are doing well. Um, but there is a whole thing where, yeah, neurodivergent high achievers are held up as like, Come on, you could be Greta Thunberg. What are you even doing? Why aren't you Chris Packham yet? Which is obviously quite unfair. Um, I feel like part of, part of the problem as well is that there aren't very many potential neurodivergent role models yet. So, you know, we're just starting to see some of the diversity of the autistic population represented among famous autistic people. Um, but because the numbers are still so small, you know, it, it's mostly a very small demographic being represented. Um, and yeah, because we're, we're talking about like famous people, there's a limit to the ex to, to how much any of them represent something that most kids could aspire to let alone most disabled kids, which, you know, we are talking about here. We're talking about people with developmental disabilities and um, society makes things difficult for us in lots of ways. So, 
you know, on one level, I kind of want to say, yes, anybody can achieve anything. You can achieve your dreams, but uh, most people don't achieve their dreams. So. I think that just to kind of follow up on that, I think that that can be, that can be something that is kind of tackled through not just looking at famous people, but also by looking at more relatable people. So that can be something where having an autistic teacher as a mentor can be much more useful because you could be like, I find this hard. They'll be like, I also find this hard. And you can have that as a dialogue rather than just being like Greta Thunberg. You know, it's more of a conversation and it's more relatable, but also it might be the kind of thing where you know, if we can identify really good books that go into things in a lot more depth, you get that information in a much richer way than you do by just saying, you know, here's Chris Packham and isn't he great? Um, you know, you get more of people's story and there's much more nuance in that rather than just identifying a single person. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's some chat in the, there's some chat in the chat. <laughs> There's some chat about whether creating a, a group for neurodivergent young people could be more activity led rather than labelled by its intended audience or membership, right? And, you know, we talked a bit at the last session about possible um, reading lists, you know, novels, right? You, kind of young people's literature that features kind of neurodivergent characters and stories. There's obviously lots of films out there and TV shows as well of variable quality and authenticity. Um, so I think it is quite difficult to pick and choose, but I wonder if any, if either of you have any thoughts about, you know, that sort of, um, those sort of creative representations of neurodivergence in fiction and the role that might play. Yeah, that, that's an interesting one, isn't it? as you say there is very variable quality um in the representations of autistic people in fiction and other neurodivergent people in fiction um but we are starting to see a lot more success from autistic writers writing autistic autistic characters um you know a kind of spark was what waterstone's book of the year blue peter something um which is fantastic to see and i'm, I'm personally looking forward to the the next book uh, show us who you are um and of course, the, the, the nice thing there is that protagonists in fiction are not necessarily like totally extraordinary. You know, some of them might be heroes. Some of them are just people doing sufficiently interesting things to appear in a book. Um, so, it, it, yeah, it takes away some of that. Um, isn't autism your superpower kind of problem? Yeah, I don't, I don't want to be too broad brush about this, but I, I'm going to make a very broad brush statement. I think that there's some really great literature that's written by autistic people, about autistic people, that is very good. And I think that there's some literature that's written about non-autistic people, that's written by non-autistic people with autistic characters, that is very stereotypical and problematic. And I think that's, you know, perhaps a, a, a good baseline to be working from, you know, wh where is where is the literature coming from and, and what can we what can we think of in terms of that? But also, kind of as Fergus was saying, it's one of those things that the more, <laughs> I know it's a varying quality, but the more literature we get, the more media that we get that represents people's diversity of stories, you know, then the lower quality ones come out in the wash. It's more about getting kind of, the more stories you get out there, the more you can tolerate the kind of not so good ones because you know, you're more likely to find something that resonates with you and that's kind of what's important. Yeah. So continuing on the theme of, of sort of role models, but thinking a bit closer to home, someone is saying that they're in the process of getting a diagnosis for autism, but they're not sure how ready they will be to out themselves to pupils. Any tips, so I assume this is a teacher, any tips for how to do this or if it's entirely necessary? Sorry, could you repeat that? Yes, they are saying that they're in the process of getting a diagnosis for autism. They're not sure how ready they will be to out themselves to pupils. And they wondered if you have any tips for how to do this 
or if this is entirely necessary. Right, right. So it's it's difficult. Um, it's difficult to know when when to bring up what and how much. Um, so once I know that a pupil is autistic or thinks they might be autistic, then I want them to know that I am. Um, and that has never felt particularly difficult. Um, I'm less confident that I want all of the rest of the kids to know that I'm autistic, but I'm I'm not in the closet as an autistic person. You know, I, I write about it, I post about it online, I am openly the chair of an autistic-led organization. So it's it's not like they can't find out if they go internet stalking, which um, certainly some of my students have in the past. I don't know if they've ever found out that I'm autistic that way, but um, like they've found songs that I've put on YouTube and things. Anyway, um, yeah, there are a lot of really difficult questions about uh, coming out to students and to other staff members, actually. Um, and that's probably at least a bigger question, as big a question for me. Um, it took me a long time to come out as autistic to anybody at work. Uh, I only really came out to the wider staff group because I was doing neurodiversity training and it was relevant. Um, and I, I posted a, a piece in Tez, Todd Times Education Supplement, Scotland. Um, autism tips from an autistic teacher. And I wanted to share that with my colleagues because I thought it would be useful. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's a bit scary being out as as autistic or any other stigmatized group. You know, um, I've I've worried that kids might use that against me in some way. Or parents or other teachers. So I don't know. For me, it's I I like people to know on balance. Um, but as far as coming coming out to students goes, like when are you, when are you gonna mention it? For me, I, I, I teach quite a lot of autistic kids, so it comes up in that context. Um, but otherwise, you know, it is, it's not really a chemistry question or a physics question, so I'm, I'm not usually going to mention it. I mean, the thing I would just briefly add is that remember that that being autistic is not the only way to be neurodivergent, right? So if you if you think about the whole um, range of ways in which people might be not neurotypical, there's probably quite a few teachers at the school who who fit into that in various ways. And so, um, you know, one of the things is thinking about just as a group of teachers being perhaps a little bit more willing to share, you know, what were your struggles when you were at school or what are the things that you still find hard now, you know, whether that has a diagnostic label attached to it or not, um, cultivating an environment where people aren't trying to look sort of perfect or, or you know, all the time. I also think it's so interesting, Fergus, that, that you're particularly motivated to share that status in the context of training and offering advice, right? Where, where being autistic then lends authority and authenticity to your message and becomes therefore a very strong part of that message, right? Which then is in direct opposition to anyone who might think that that would be a disadvantage or a negative element, right? It's quite interesting to me. Yeah, although even there, the first time that I, I did university training for my school, um, I did not explicitly come out in the course of the training it was only when I sent around this article later, which I have no idea how many people read, that it specifically mentioned it. But I, I did another round of training uh, just a few weeks ago in which I did right at the start say, uh, I am an autistic teacher, that's where I'm coming from with this. So I think we should draw to a close, but I'm just gonna read out this one comment that's come up because it's such a nice one. Thank you very much for sharing it. Um, they say, just an observation, my son, 
12 years old, is part of a peer support group organized through a charity. The group are all autistic and he loves it because he's with a non-judgmental group that are just great fun to be with. So thank you so much for sharing that. I'm really happy for your son and really happy with this other bit of evidence that we might be on the right track with the kind of peer support work that Catherine's doing. Um, Catherine Fergus, anything that you want to say just to finish up before we say goodbye to everyone? No, thank you for, for inviting us along to speak. It's been, it's been really good. I hope it's been useful. And um, yeah, hopefully we'll have some um, nice materials to share in not too long. And yeah, looking forward to that. Yeah, th thanks. thanks a lot for this. Um, am I allowed to plug something I did last week a little bit? Definitely, plug away. Yeah, so um, as part of Neurodiversity Celebration Week, which you may know was last week, um, I took part in a sort of, I want to say panel discussion, but that's not quite right. It was, it was an online event with neurodivergent teachers talking about their experiences and their understanding and the relevance of neurodiversity to their work. Um, so myself and Pete Hornby, who's also autistic, and at least one teacher with each of ADHD and dyslexia and Um, so that's on Disability Ed UK on YouTube. Well, we'll make sure it goes up in our list of resources. So um, uh, we are going to publish this third talk and, and Q&A session. Um, we'll put them all together with the speaker biographies. We'll put the slides up so you've got those. We'll put a bunch of links to resources that people have mentioned across the talks and other things that we think might be useful. Maybe some suggested reading, maybe a film list, you know. Um, and um, yeah, and, and we would love your support sharing that with your colleagues, sharing that across other schools, um, and we'll, we'll work to engage kind of, um, you know, all the organisations that oversee education and see if um, they want to kind of pick up some of what we've been doing. So thank you all for this kind of grassroots um, swell of support. It really is very meaningful and we hope that we can um, share some of these messages and we hope that they have been useful to you as well.